broadcasting live from the Green Room Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. It's the At Home Show with Josh Carey and David Bates, celebrating 25 years of home and garden wisdom. Without further ado, your hosts, Josh Carey and David Bates. Oh, yeah. One moment, get in the camera. Everybody knows what that music means. We know where we are anyway. It's time to climb a tree, don your loincloth, and survey the backyard to find a there project to lay in the unmarked grave of history. Welcome in, everybody. It is the At Home Show. It's your Saturday morning tradition right here from the Green Room Studios at Bates Nursery and Garden Center. Good morning, David Bates. And good morning to you, Josh. And uh-huh. um, glad to have everyone aboard today. We'll get yes. the general introductions done all around here shortly. But okay. first of all... Let's get to the weather. You know, we've been having some here for the last bit. Really? And today, uh, mm, well, could be some more showers. Yeah. Uh, hopefully nothing extreme. Uh, folks in West Tennessee obviously have taken it on the chin mm. uh, recently. Uh, some areas I think in Union City got almost a foot, like I think 11.6 inches of rain. So it's uh, That's a little close to roof pretty, right too, so. Yeah, yeah, pretty <laughs> devastating uh, conditions, and hopefully we've got some drying conditions going through today, but we could have some thunderstorms mm-hmm. this morning. Today is Saturday, uh, and it is the 5th of August, and as we mm-hmm. roll into August now, we're, um, we're in that time of year, and in the weather pattern that we're in, we have no idea when it's going to rain and when it's not, no. only that there is a chance every day it could be torrential, it might not be any. And that's just the way it is, so uh, we can accept it or uh, we can you know, be in angst about it. Angst. 90 degrees for the high temperature today with uh, some morning thunderstorms. More of the same tomorrow, 91 degrees, and still uh, a chance of some thunderstorms. It looks like Monday and Tuesday currently are going to be mostly, at least mostly sunny to partly cloudy conditions. It's kind of a... Uh, a a nuanced difference between those you see that the cloud doesn't look different on uh those two so uh anyway Hmm. getting on into wednesday thursday friday saturday sunday Monday. it it looks like we've got rain in the forecast uh Mm -hmm. maybe on wednesday could be and thursday it could be substantial uh the the (laughs) important thing for everyone to be uh, mindful of is to stay weather aware we're going to click over here to the radar quickly and uh that did not give me but you do see that we've got a storm system let me see if i can blow this up here i didn't refresh that before the show but yes you see now there are some uh, uh, again that Uh appears to be going to the west of us so uh Folks in uh, western Tennessee, uh, western middle Tennessee, are, man, they have really been taking it on the chin. And there, you know, you can see by virtue of the uh, of how that looks, it's a uh, pretty nasty looking front coming through there. So hopefully, uh, the folks can avoid further flooding, but that does not look favorable. Uh, here, officially at the Bates Nursery Weather Station, we. Uh, we are continuing to add to those annual totals, and it's uh, not an insignificant amount. We are approaching our average Yearly. annual rainfall yes. uh, here in our uh, 30, almost 37 inches for the year. We've uh, received an inch and a quarter this month already, just five days into it. And our most recent e- event, uh, a couple of, or a day back, was about an inch and a quarter. So, uh, 99% relative humidity. It's uh, currently 74 degrees here in the Music City. So uh, the operative word is stay weather aware. Do not uh, let your guard down. Uh, there's no need to be in panic mode, but certainly kind of a lot better opportunity and a lot better chance to avoid uh, as much personal injury and those kinds of things as possible simply by being weather aware. So be aware. Don't uh, don't let your guard down. Stay mm-hmm. tuned in. We'll do what we can to help you. There's a lot of other local sources available, so make sure you stay apprised of that. And now it's time to get on with the show here. And, of course, for, Josh, for, we have yes. said our good mornings. 
Tyler, good morning to you as well. Good morning, We're David. Good Josh. morning, Happy Tyler. Happy to have you What's here up? today. Were it not for Tyler, as most Saturday mornings, we would not <laughs> have gotten on the air. Mm -hmm. So it was a pretty touch and go today, but we did make that happen. Uh, looking across the way, Caroline Gant, Austin Lowen, welcome in, guys. We have our, our, Cabs our back. A team. Mm -hmm. We have the full we have the full crew here today, so it's good to see everyone. How are you guys today? Wonderful. Great. Just great. <laughs> what a <Wonderful> nice day. <laughs> great. And we've got a, uh, Caroline has really put forth a colorful display around uh, the studio today. We're decidedly tropical thing. Huh? We the tropical. Weather we've been, mm -hmm. With the weather we've been having, it could not be more appropriate. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, we were so, decorating yesterday and it was in the rain. So we were like, are we going to? you know, haul in wet yuck plants in here, or are we just going <laughs> to do house plants? So we just did house plants because they were dry. And Austin decided to go with a pink theme. So actually, we did this one together. Wow. I love he pink loves foliage the color pink. so much. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I like pink flowers, too. I would argue that pine trees are house plants, actually. Would you? Yes. Pine Why? trees are house plants. What do they make houses out of? <laughs> Well, think about it. You've got a point. Okay. You do have a point, yes. Josh. Uh -huh. Yeah, but so, so that means on drywall top of my is also a house plant, right? Gypsum is good in the uh, in, in that, isn't it? Yeah, you use gypsum in soil, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, loosens okay. up some, yeah, that's some okay. clay. That's what we have to work with are the materials that are located on planet Earth until we can figure out a way to economically uh, haul those back from wherever the moon, Mars, <laughs> asteroids. Those that kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. anyway, I am certain that there are questions that are out there. Oh boy, from our um, many viewers, and we always appreciate those for taking the time to uh, either go in through our Facebook page or Instagram pages and um, put questions you out too. there. We also have a we also have a link that uh, we put out through the weekly newsletter that I write, and this week was no exception. So. But without further ado, unless you've got something else you want to go to, Caroline and Austin, let's uh, proceed. Let's do it. I think we're ready for questions. All right. I am wondering if a Ruby Falls or another Weeping Redbud would be good on the southwest side of a house. The area does take some wind, and I know it will have, have to be staked. The area is full sun with dappled late afternoon shade. Zone 7A in northwest Tennessee. If it would not be a good place for that particular tree, can you suggest something weepy and in that color for the area? A weeping redbud? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, Josh. Oh, oh yeah? Oh, they yeah. are gorgeous. Oh, yeah. They're there. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see why that would be a bad decision at all. A weeping, oh. you know, th that's one of the only, like, weeping purple redbuds, or really anything weepy that has that color is really that plant specifically. So... I think it's an excellent choice for something like that. Now, you might have to prune it eventually. You know, with most weeping things, the height doesn't change too, too much, okay? That, that's slow to change because you've got the stems that go up a little bit, but then they turn down. That's the whole point of the weeping habit. Uh, the difference is, is the width really changes. So at some point, if it were to age and get upwards of, you know, say you've got 20 years old on you or something, you might have to eventually, you know, prune out the width of that plant being on the corner of the home, but... Other than that, I don't see any reason why that would be a bad choice because I don't know of any other, y'all correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't think of any other weeping dark leaf like that. Weeping chocolate mimosa. Oh. Ooh. Hey. Which I had yep. and this winter killed um, what was grafted, so now it's just a regular mimosa. Mm. Well, at least you still got something. Yeah, yeah at least I mean, still got something. Yeah. One of, the, one of the things that, particularly uh, with red buds, and they seem to be highly susceptible to it are, ambrosia beetles or other borers so mm. if you're going to use of uh, that i mean they seem to move in overnight it's hard to you know if you ever if you wake up one morning and there appear to be toothpicks coming out of your tree you know what has happened to you why don't we talk a, a little bit about that austin and because this is the time of year when those kind of things are prevalent and mm -hmm. it's never good news if you get that uh, message yeah. Plants. Mm -hmm. No, and the, the funny thing, this year has been it literally rampant with these bugs, and it's mainly because of the stress. So ambrosia beetles pick on trees that are stressed. They just do. It's a well-known fact. Um, I talked to a grower from Maple Valley, which is down in Alabama, who brings us plants. He's a great grower of plants. And um, he was telling me the stories about how he moved a Japanese maple one time, and it was very stressed. 
And after he had moved it and tried to transplant it and, and relocate it, it very quickly got ambrosia beetle. And it was just because of the stress of the plant. And I don't know what kind of signals that trees give off or whatever, but it's a stress thing. Hmm. And whenever that happens, ambrosia beetle can move in very quickly. And whenever they do, it's a it's a, a it's a battle you're not going to win. I'm sorry. They just, they're a plant killer. And what David's talking about is like these, uh, it's called frass. It's where they tunnel in it's a boring insect that tunnels into the stem and then it kicks out like this, you know, like the leftover uh, blar- sawdust. Yeah, yes. it's like sawdust pretty much. It just pokes out of the tree. Um, and it'll stay there as long as like wind or rain doesn't knock it off. And that's how you can tell if you've got ambrosia beetle. And you can really tell if you have, you have ambrosia beetle because your plant is going to die. I mean, it, it looks absolutely awful. And really the only way to you know to deal with that is to really you know dig it up and burn it uh to kind of get rid of those insects if you can so this has definitely been a huge year for ambrosia beetle i've seen it all over the place and it's mainly because this winter just stressed our plants a lot of them very hard so um and red buds are no exception they 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 can certainly you know get that as well they seem for whatever reason they seem to be susceptible even when the stress is not so largely a part of the equation but Mm -hmm. Is your you mentioned? There's a lot of indications of that. Uh, Steve Arnold, our assistant GM, is telling me he uh, had to uh, dig out and burn a crepe myrtle mm-hmm. in his yard. I saw that, it. Uh, he showed me wow. the picture of it. It was yep. awful. I mean, it was yep. riddled with it. So that was uh, so. Yeah. And, and you know, and riddling is what it does. It, it's, yeah. There's no there's no mild uh, ambrosia beetle infestation. Uh, Nah, it just it gets bad and it does it almost immediately. Mm-hmm. Now, it's amazing the, how quickly they can they can attack. Now, when the viewers wanting to plant this on the corner of the house, would they really be good? Be, would it be a good idea for them to have a tape measure when they do this and and put it a little bit further away than they think it really needs to be? Almost in any scenario yeah. for me, with any tree you decide to put on the corner of your home, yeah, like bring it out as much as you can. You know. It, make a make a rounded a bubble in your bed or something that's out a little bit from the corner of the bed or out from the corner of the home. Um, I think that always looks a little bit better, yes. Well, and especially yeah, the as single mature. Largest, yeah. Yeah, you know, the single largest, uh, most frequent mistake that we see people uh, doing is that they, they tend to plant things so that it looks right at the size it is when Today, it is yeah. planted mm-hmm. as, as opposed to how it will look and you know these things grow and if if you need to have that proven to you just plant it too close it's going to get too big so it you you have to be able to put it out there at a distance that seems uncomfortably spacious it doesn't look right right now david yeah Mm -hmm. yeah but it will given a little bit of time would if the house was brick would that uh, affect it maybe a little bit southwest corner i think is what they say i mean not get really too much with red okay. buds. Red buds okay. can take full sun all day long. I mean, yeah, they can live in the woods or on the okay. wood line, and they can be, uh, you know, they're shade tolerant, mm-hmm. but they, they're totally fine with full sun. It's kind of like a dogwood. You see them grow. You mm-hmm. see the nurseries growing them there, right out in full sun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah all the trees are grown really, in yeah. fields, and you know, all of our deciduous hardwood yeah. trees typically come from McMinnville, and they're grown in fields, just big, huge, full sun fields that have no shade at all. So. Like I said, shade tolerant, but uh-huh. to get the best effect, the real honestly, full sun is, is recommended. Let's keep on this tree topic, okay. shall we? All Recommendation right. for a medium-sized shade tree on a corner lot with power lines on either side. Ooh, okay. a little Don't. bit tricky. Medium-sized shade tree. I'm going one of David's favorites, and that's Styrax. Oh, that's a good mm. one. Mm-hmm. The old Japanese snowbell. Beautiful little white dainty blooms atop of this medium sized to small tree. It does have a fairly wide canopy. It's almost similar in width as it is to height at maturity, though. This plant's fairly slow to grow, so it's okay with the power lines. It'll be a while before you'd have to do anything about that, uh, but that's that's where I'm going. I like a good Styrax tree. Hardly anybody even knows about a Styrax tree, but when you have one, they are certainly pretty. Something more column there for sure. Absolutely, if you, it would be what I would think because I'm I'm about to deal with this complimentary six year trimming with the power company, so <laughs> yeah. The, I guess the problem with a columnar tree is that it's just not really a shade tree, right? You know, they want oh, some true. shade. 
I guess that the, you know, the, it depends on the time of day. I mean, it's kind of like there you a, go. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you can go stand. Now, in one it. of the things you can do to uh, work around Josh the uh-huh. complimentary pruning, and it does involve the personal outlay of cash, is to have it done yourself preemptively so that you get it uh, pruned the way you want it pruned, as opposed to what might just be a cropping off at a given foot mark. And it's going to look like it's well. It needs to be done off, so. anyway. But I mean, I, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna let them do what they're gonna do, and then maybe I can talk them into going around the other side of the tree. I don't know that I'll be successful, but maybe I can. Well, if you're leaving, be there when they're doing it. Uh-huh. That's the question. Uh-huh. Trust me. <laughs> we'll so be. one All of right. our listeners wants to transplant a rose of Sharon that is one year old, and they're wondering when is the best time. <laughs> Josh, three thirty. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. I was waiting. <laughs> uh, do this over the winter time. That's going to be the the least stressful on the plant. Okay, so when it's dormant, has no leaves, you don't have to worry so much about water or hardly at all. Really, um, have your hole dug like we've always talked about. Get it, you know, get your site prepped where you want it to go. Dig it up. Put it in there quickly, water it in really good, and then let it be. But let's wait. Let's just three thirty one day in February. There you go. That's Correct right. in yep. February. Not I transplanted now. one this winter, and it did great. And I'm going to transplant it again because that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Rosa, Rosa Sharon is so tough. I mean, it's such a tough plant. It didn't I mean, even wilt. No. Um, actually, so I think I transplanted it in the spring, and it was already leafing out. It was because I planted an Amsonia where it was, mm. and. It had no shock at all. Hmm. You it, can't hurt a Rosa Sharon. Already. No, you can't. Maybe I mean, it's feelings, but not physically. You can't hurt his feelings either. It's fine. It's, it's all happy. <laughs> right now, they are in full show. Like, it's yes. a great Rosa Sharon year. They are money right now. Mm-hmm. They it is gorgeous. They are money indeed. They are. They're gorgeous. Uh-huh. Money trees, if you will. Okay, let's talk about lavender a little bit. Hmm. All my lavender got incinerated by this heat. What variety does best in our climate? I planted phenomenal this year, and it so far is doing fantastic. That is probably our tried and true cultivar that we all kind of get behind around here. It's called phenomenal, like she just said, lavender. But honestly, there's another reason why your lavender did that. It's not the heat. It's usually moist. lavender can take heat just about as good as anything. It's usually what's going on beneath the yeah. soil level with mm-hmm. lavender, and it really needs a well drained scenario, even. Um, you know, like a, a gravelly type mix you can mix in kind of with your soil or some people even use sand a little bit. I'm not big on sand all that much, but for lavender specifically, it can be helpful. So I I'm don't think it was the heat. Hop huh? in real quickly because I was just talking about mine that I planted this year. And I have two others that I planted and just, uh, I did use garden mix. All my other plants are doing great. The lavender is doing okay. And then in a different bed, like Austin was saying, I used Enlighten, with this, which is Earth Mix Expanded Shale. And I put it underneath, because Austin had actually suggested that. And that is the one that is not struggling at all. It looks gorgeous. It's in full bloom right now, and it's gotten huge. And this is the first year that I've had no issues whatsoever with lavender. Uh-huh. And she's talking about Expanded Shale, which is those little tiny rocks, pretty much, is what it looks like to y'all. But adding that into your mix with lavender is such a great thing to do. It's just they really, really like that. A nice, loose, well-drained soil. And they'll be fine through the summer heat. Really, any variety is fine through the summer heat. It's more of the winter time that we have issues with lavender. And that's certainly over the winter time. Those rocks are very, very useful in the in the ground because they can get wet. We can get wet here over the winter time, and lavender does not like that. So, uh, yeah, and what if people are wondering what expanded shale actually is? It is indeed shale that has been heated mm-hmm. and uh, blown like up. up to about 1500 degrees yeah. and it makes it puff up and becomes porous right and that also makes it a, a less dense product if you've seen pop, uh, pop rocks ever had, <laughs> if you've ever had if you've ever had lightweight concrete uh, it is uh, lightweight because it has had this expanded shale product used as the aggregate part of the concrete mm. instead of limestone which is much more dense uh, mm-hmm. but it lacks the porosity. So uh, it, this is a product that has a variety of uses, and one of which is, and we use it in a number of different earth mix products as a standalone and also as an additive to promote drainage. So uh, expanded shale is one of those things that's really good, and unlike things such as perlite, it doesn't get crushed and break down uh, so easily. So it'll stay pretty much permanently once you get it into the soil and it'll give that much needed drainage that 
things uh, such as lavender have got to have if you're if they're going to have any chance at success, particularly when we're going through summers like these where we kept keep getting these monsoon waves that come through. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love Enlighten. I use it, like I said, I used it in my garden beds, but I also use it with a lot of house plants, uh, specifically succulents, and it's a great top dressing for uh, Dracaena, cacti, succulents, um, when you're potting up your house plants. Yeah, any of those plants that you pot up that are house plants mainly, they can be wiggly, you mm-hmm. know, like it's really hard to kind of keep them where you want them. So after you finish potting it up, adding that rock to it will kind of seed it where it needs to be and it doesn't wiggle all that bad and plus it just looks really cool it does on top of like you know you repot a cactus or something and you put that rock down below it it just looks like it should be there so it's nice to just have a bag of this at your house whenever you might need it for certain little applications well isn't that ironic because i think there's a sale on all this bagged earth mix this week isn't there david boots We'll get there. Okay. We'll get yeah, there. Like, we yeah, gotta jump in the gut, and it's not everything, Josh. We got oh, a, it's not we, everything. Okay, we, we got well, a live it, one. It, okay, for for those who actually read the newsletter, yes, uh, I read it. it. Gives very I didn't detailed. read it thoroughly, well, obviously. <laughs> well, you you missed a, one little thing, but okay. you're on the right track. Okay, so we we'll get to that in a bit. But tell what we'll talk about right now. We will kind of discuss the entire uh, line of Earth Mix products, and. Uh, because we really believe in the product. Uh, mm-hmm. It is a product that we have developed here, and we have developed it with the absolute success uh, being the primary uh, motivation. You know, How can you do the best with the investment of both time, your labor, and the financial resources that are required? How can you make sure you do everything really? you can to get the best uh Bang for the buck out of your plants. And we believe Earth Mix Garden Products are the answer to that question. No matter what ch- which product that you're choosing, whether it's Earth Mix Garden, which is kind of the flagship brand, Earth Mix Proganics O, mm-hmm. Proganics I, which is are both professional potting mixes, one for outdoor, one for indoor. Uh, Earth Mix Supernatural, which is uh, the basis of several uh, products and is a standalone product on its own. All of these products are 100% organic produced. There, are, There's no peat in any uh, other products. It's just time to put your comment in there, Josh. It's uh, the Beatles. It has no peat. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, and it's more than that. It gives you uh-huh. the optimum and growing uh, capacity for your plants. So if you want to have the best growing that you can possibly have for your plants with a minimal amount of effort, mm-hmm. uh, work through most of these problem issues with products such as Enlighten, like we've been talking about here for the last bit. Uh, go down to the uh, Find Earth Mix uh, tab on earthmix.net. And once you're there, just click on that. And it'll show you the map of all the uh, sites around Middle Tennessee, or actually the entire state of Tennessee, as well as Kentucky, into uh, southern Illinois, southern, uh, southern Illinois, southern Indiana, and southern Ohio, Northern Alabama, and uh, there's always more locations coming around. So make sure you check that out at earthmix.net. You can put mm-hmm. in, in the search bar your address. It'll give you turn-by-turn directions to the retailer that is nearest you. And we really appreciate the network of fine um, independent retailers that support the EarthMix yep. brand. So remember this, success in gardening begins at the ground level. And you use Earthmix garden products, and we appreciate you giving us a moment to speak about that, help you with your garden, and take some of the work out of it. Live questions coming in from the Bates Facebook page. Yes. Barbara's asking, do you have suggested plants for a small rain garden, like around a downspout? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. You know my go-to on this always is switchgrass. Mm Mm-hmm. That's a great I one. I love my switchgrass. It's only like four to five foot tall, stays nice and tidy, very upright, handles that water just fine. Uh-huh. Uh, there's a lot of different rain garden plants. We get this a lot. There's a lot of uh, builders in Nashville that once they finish a home, they have to install like a rain garden, and they have to. They come out here and they ask us, and we've got a whole list of plants that are rain garden approved. Um, something like Itea comes to mind. It's a good yep. little uh, rain garden plant that's got really pretty fall color, a great little bloom. It's an underused plant, really. A lot of people don't know about it. Sweet Spire is a common name. Um, and there's a dwarf variety that doesn't get all that big. You know, you're talking three to four feet tall. That's about it. Um, that can certainly handle the water. You know what I saw? I saw a, uh, uh, I was at the lake uh, last week 
Y'all miss me? I was I was out, you know, I was out boating. I was out Jet chilling. Skiing. I was on the beach and out of we reach. We know you missed us as yeah. well. Yeah. I did. I really did miss y'all. I love doing this. <laughs> but uh, um, I saw button bush, a native <gasps> button bush on plant. on the corner of the lake, just living. Not necessarily small. It gets kind of big, but <clears throat> button bush is cool, and it can live in that water, hmm. just right on the edge, just blooming. I'm just like, how'd this get here? You know, you just think about it. Like, in the <laughs> middle of the lake, I'm just like kind of on the wood line, and there's a button bush. I'm like, hey, we sell those. Isn't that crazy? Check it out. Some it bird is. probably dropped it. <laughs> probably. Anyway. I've got You're another... deep in thought over there. I know. <laughs> I, I've got another uh, one that I kind of trialed. I heard about Golden Alexander, which is a, a host plant for the swallowtail butterfly. And I planted it right where my AC unit drains. Mm-hmm. And in the summer, it's literally like a puddle, and it's doing just fine. It's nice and lush. And then I've got a I've got a, a blue shadow Father Gila sitting very close to that as well. Blue shadow, shadow Father Fowler. Gila. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a great native plant. Huh. Um, Fall the, color. the leaves are incredible. Like they're like misty blue leaves. It's got spring blooms that are kind of uh, bottle brush like. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then yes, Austin, the fall color. That's is, why you is phenom bomb. Uh-huh. Dot com. I've got yep. one kind of under an AC unit that drains and it's doing fantastic. It doesn't mm-hmm. like a lot of sun though. I also have one no, in mine, a full sun spot. It's growing, but it loses its blue look on the leaves. Mm-hmm. Mine's yeah, morning to midday. A couple of other sun. things to think about are, are equisetum uh, and papyrus. Those are both plants that are well known to be aquatic marginal plants. So, you know, if you've got a really wet spot, you know, they give you some different looks in the landscape and they're, you know, another very nice touch. So, you know, the the good thing about it is, I guess the point of all this is that uh, there's a whole lot of different looks you can get and still uh, be able to manage a wet spot and have a good look in the process. Mm -hmm. Didn't have to be a weeping willow, something that's going to get, Way too big, yeah. and and maybe not last all that long. You know, they're they're not a long life tree. You might get 15, 20 years out of it, but uh, typically that's about it, and they'll get big. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hey, Caroline. Hey, Nyla is asking. My snake plant is producing two babies. Is it okay <gasps> for me to repot her in Earth Mix now, or should I wait until after the babies have come through the soil more? You can repot it now. Those are really, really, really hardy plants, especially when they start growing pups, but they like to be really tight in their pot. So I suggest if those pups, those new little plants that are coming up, are not pushing against the pot or close to it, I would leave it in that pot until next year and then repot it. Mm-hmm. But now is the time to do it if you want to go ahead and it's pushing out of that. And uh, Earth Mix Proganics I if that is accessible to you, is a great thing to use with that. I usually mix a little bit of perlite to help with drainage because those like to stay dry. But congratulations, you got some babies on that snake plant. Hey, you want to know about my snake plant? Yes, we are dying to know about it. (laughs) I've had the same snake plant in a pot for 12 (laughs) years. 12 years, people. How does it look? Same pot. How does it look? Oh, at the moment, it looks absolutely awful. But that's just because I recently had my daughter cut it back. My my middle daughter, she's five years old. Marley is her name. She's crazy, but she is fantastic. Everybody loves Marley. (laughs) Shout out, Marley. Hope you're watching. Uh, She likes to get my clippers and clip things, okay? She'll go out and clip flowers like you wouldn't believe. Mm -hmm. They just love their flowers. I let them pluck them. I don't care. But my snake plant was getting a little, you you know, not great. It was inside. It gets low light inside. My home is horrible with light. I cannot grow houseplants well through the winter time i just get them through okay now all my houseplants are out right now on my front porch and they look great uh but over the winter they don't and the snake plant was that way and like i said 12 years in the same pots a little tight caroline's talking about how they like to stay tight and they do but this one that's real tight (laughs) real tight (laughs) so i had her cut every single leaf to the dirt every single one of them to the dirt all right so but what i realized the other day and what i saw is i've got no foliage whatsoever except they're they're starting you know it's coming back it's totally fine wonder if there's a connection yeah I, mm-hmm, yeah. Weird, huh? But <laughs> cause and effect, you said. Uh huh. There's okay. no foliage, but there is a singular bloom spike. Wow. Oh, it is in. Yeah. F- it is blooming right now as we speak. This tall bloom spike with no foliage below it that is starting to come back. So there you go. Like Caroline said, very hardy plant. I've had it forever, and uh, it's it is tight. 
is. Those blooms, too, on <laughs> Sansevieria, a lot of times will smell really sweet. So mm -hmm. once it starts to open, give it a little smell, see yeah. how it how it does. But I have found with Sansevieria, if you give them like an extreme climate change or you cut them back, they will bloom. It's like they're saying, help me in a way. Mine is blooming. Yeah, mine pretty much blooms every single year. I, you know, they typically do. Probably because it's been in that pot for 12 oh, years. Oh, yeah, it's great. I water it like <laughs> uh -huh. Five times a year, <laughs> maybe. Whenever I do water it, I soak it. I mean, really soak it. But like, it's literally like five times a year. It might get water. Yeah, they don't it's like crazy. water. So no. take hey, a take a note out of Austin's book over there. Hey, leaves don't are clean. Overwater your house plants. Leaves are clean. Y'all follow up. Uh, what fertilizer do you recommend for indoor plants? For indoor plants, so I'm. I wouldn't say I'm lazy. I just have a lot of house plants. So I like a slow release that I do once a year. I use Osmocote for a lot of my plants. And then I'll supplement with just kind of a general house plant fertilizer. I've actually started using Jack's Orchid Food because it has a high nitrogen count um, for most of my house plants to supplement that. So like I said, you could use just a general liquid fertilizer. But I am having good luck with orchid food right now. It's not the bloom booster orchid food. It's just the regular one that you feed them until they start blooming. What, mm -hmm. what about fantastic. the old, uh, the old uh, wives adage about banana peel water? I've, I've heard good <laughs> things about banana peel water. I don't really do it. Um, okay. But yeah. there was a there was a there was some derision <laughs> coming from Austin over there. <laughs> I don't know about all that. I don't know what the nitrogen content of a banana water is, but it's probably less than one percent. So it kind of just depends on what you want Way to achieve, y'all. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, if you're trying it's to push potassium, leafy growth, I think is what it no, was. Potassium. Yeah. I mean, potassium is great. That's a you know a macronutrient that's yeah. needed. That makes everything kind of happen with plants. All the cells do things that they need to do with potassium. All that stuff. Um, but really, it, it all depends on what you're trying to achieve. If right. you're trying to achieve, achieve leafy growth, then you want high nitrogen, which is that first number. First number. You yeah. know, if you mm -hmm. want to produce a lot of blooms, then you want more of that second number. And, or if your roots are not doing all that great, you want to help out with that second number. And then, yeah, the third number is potassium. And that's just a general, you need that nutrient to make everything okay. work. I'm sure it'll make the plants happy. I did uh, have a friend who would do it that I lived with for a long time. And I remember he would soak a bunch of banana peels. It was a long time ago, and the plants did respond to it really well. Um, I know me, and I know I'd forget about it, and it'd get really gross, and gross. I wouldn't want to pour it out. So <laughs> I'm all about just Osmocote, like you yeah. talked about at first. Just sprinkle some Osmocote on, and that stuff feeds for like three months. Yeah, I will usually do Osmocote late March, um, early April, and then it'll feed through the growing mm -hmm. season. Then, like I said, I'll supplement with like a liquid fertilizer, but I love it. And again, that Jack's Orchid food amazing what's the numbers on and, and really what makes uh, osmocote 30, 10, such 10, a, a great 30, choice 10, yeah. particularly so for 20, maybe 20. Dang. the uh, osmocote <laughs> is such a great choice for a lot of indoor things uh is that uh, uh organics were all about that but if you use them inside they kind of smell like they're organic really? Really? that's the problem yeah yeah <laughs> so uh, if, if you use a slow release sulfur coated uh, fertilizer such as Osmocote, it will give you a nice slow release. It won't burn, and you don't get any um, unsavory smells that you might get from something that goes, "Wow, who?" Mm. And it's so died easy. In here. I mean, it's just yeah. so easy. Yeah, it's it easy if you have a lot of house plants. You can't remember when you fertilize. You know, certain last. They're great. Quarterly. Well, we have another houseplant question. Okay. So we have somebody asking, how do I clean the leaves on my Monstera and fiddle leaf fig? They are currently covered in dust. So there are a lot of products, a lot of leaf cleaner products out there. Um, I always suggest staying away from the synthetic ones. I don't think they're great for the plant because all you really need is like a microfiber cloth towel and some water just to wipe it off. We're just trying to clean it. We're not trying to treat anything. So there's no need to add anything to like shine it up and make it look prettier for a week. But in reality, in the long run, it's probably gonna be pretty bad for your plant. So just start with microfiber water. You can use a little bit of diluted neem oil if it's bad. Cool. Um, lemon juice, diluted lemon juice will also help with like those water deposits that get on the leaves and can get pretty hard to get off. But it is important to clean your plant leaves, too, because they can't photosynthesize properly if they can't get that sun through that whole layer of dust and debris to get to the leaf itself. So, you know, take a day, walk around your house, clean your plants. It'll also give you time to inspect it, see if there's any problems, any pests. If your plant is trying to tell you something, like it's time to be repotted. But no need to go wild and big with that. Just 
a cloth and a little bit of water. Yeah, and those microfibers, uh, you can get them at places like Northern Tool. You can get 10 of them in a Dollar General. Yeah, yeah for, anywhere. For like nine cents or something like that. So, they are all and over. It, and they're along great. The same, huh? Along the same vein of uh, people who have solar panels know that they have to clean them because dust accumulation is going to reduce the amount of light that's available to create power that you're trying to do. So, by the same token, you know, plants, that's where they get a substantial part of their energy is directly from the sun. So mm-hmm. if they're particularly if they're indoors where that they are not exposed to natural rainfall, that dust does accumulate at times. You might just want to haul it outside and spray it with a hose might be the easiest thing to do and mm-hmm. then let it dry and then bring it back in. Mm-hmm. Yep. Just taking care of that. That's just regular maintenance right there that all those things need to have done. All right, so let's take a little shift and talk about fall veggie gardening. We're starting to get a lot of questions on that. I think uh-huh. we took a dip in the weather. At, uh, we were in the 100s, and we've been kind of in the 80s the last week, which has been really, really nice. So I think people are starting to get excited about getting those fall veggies in the ground. So we have people wondering, is now a good time to start some stuff that they can harvest in the fall? And then what kind of plants do you suggest for a fall garden bed? All right. If you're going to be starting stuff from seed, it probably is a good time to go ahead and get that going. Um, You know, generally we get our fall veggies um, roughly mid, you know, the middle of this month of August Mm. and all the way into like early September. There is a pretty specific window on when you want to get those out typically. And that's that's mainly based on our weather. And every year is different here. Okay, some years we have good fall veggies. Some years we don't. It's just part of being in middle Tennessee. Um, But there are specific veggies that you're going to grow in the fall and this is going to be mainly your brassica family plant so this is this is broccoli this is cabbage cauliflower uh brussels sprouts what am i missing cilantro i like to grow in the fall i think it's a great one to grow in the fall um parsley as well parsley's fine parsley is a perennial herb okay. i mean oh, you wow. can, yeah i mean it's going to live even it almost it a lot of times will stay evergreen through the winter doesn't necessarily look great but it you know stays up um time <laughs> yes. it's good to throw in there but um yeah carrots even you can probably get away with doing beets uh-huh. uh, collards radishes radishes those. all Arugula. those you know all the veggies that Swiss i don't really jar. like that you don't really like all <laughs> i like the ones to grow them. austin hates i like to grow them but i'm just like <laughs> I, ain't, I ain't trying to eat a beet i don't know i love oh, beets you turnip greens what's wrong with you no, i don't like a beet no turnip greens are just whatever even pickled beets you don't like those no i don't like pickled beets Turnip like greens and hot water cornbread. I like turnip from, greens. Oh. I don't like the actual turnip. Oh, okay. Who likes really likes a turnip? They just throw them in there like, eh. Miss Betty used it's to put a, put a little bit of the turnip in with the turnip greens and cook them in there with the fat back and oh, okay. hot water cornbread. Okay. Okay. Oh, David Bates. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. Oh, oh Josh oh, Carey. Oh, yeah. hot water cornbread. <laughs> Hold on to your names, folks. <laughs> Hot water cornbread. All right, we do have a question about rhubarb. I planted 15-year-old rhubarb from Pennsylvania in August of 2022. We had three small pulls this spring, and it was very healthy. What earth mix product do you recommend to protect it this winter? How and when to apply? I'm surprised that they got it to grow. I know, me too, actually. It's great in Pennsylvania. My grandmother lives in Pennsylvania. She used to grow rhubarb. It was great up there. Down here, it can be a little tricky, so I'm happy that you've got it yes. doing well. Um, but if you're going to top dress with a product, probably going to be our Supernatural, which is our compost blend that we have here, and it's always yeah. a good time to put that down. I don't care if it's summertime, wintertime, springtime, whatever. If you want to add organic material with a compost blend, like adding our Supernatural mix is, is the way to go for yep. that. So that's what I would say. And you might want to cover it even maybe a – well, no, they are fine with the cold. Yeah, yeah, I, like I have to cold. like protect it, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, the the cold is not the issue uh-uh. for rhubarb. It's it's heat. It's heat and yeah. the other issue with rhubarb is that why if, if rhubarb is so good, why is it that you have to use about like eighty or ninety percent strawberries when you're making like a rhubarb pie <laughs> uh-huh. to make it palatable? You know, it's 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 are all parts unusual, of it edible? Yeah, mm. don't know about all parts. No, I mean, the leaves, but, it's not like poke or anything where you have to just watch the roots. Because you never yeah, see anything it, except the stalks in the grocery store. Not that store. I've ever heard of, but okay. I, I'm assuming the leaves and roots probably just don't taste good. Okay. I mean, mm-hmm. kind of like David said, I don't, yeah. stems don't even taste like He's not a sour <laughs> kind of guy. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it's okay. It's I okay? Just, um, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, it's not my thing, but okay. you know, I'm okay with it being other people's things, just like the beats. I'm with Kev on that. I, yeah, I'm, I, no, Renee loves beats. I love beats but, too. Uh, me too. I'm not a beat fan. Nah, yeah. me neither. Mm-mm. Tastes That's like the way Earth. it goes. Hey, let's take a moment Tastes and talk like about what? where we are today. Uh, and that place is Bates Nursery and Garden Center. Uh-huh. And for those of you who um, you probably know that because you're watching this program. Yes. Uh, for for the last 91 years, Bates Nursery Garden Center is bringing Middle Tennessee uh, the, the absolute finest selection of mm-hmm. trees, shrubs, ground covers, tropical plants, perennials, edible landscape plants, ornamental grasses, any kind of tree you can think of, and a lot you probably can't think of. That's what we've got at Bates Nursery and Garden Center. More than that, and that's kind of the basis of this program, we have expertise. We're here to help you have success in your gardening efforts and to help you make the right choices. We're not here to choose it for you, but what we're here to kind of steer you along and say, well, here are the things in this particular application that might do well, that we can kind of ascertain that information by you bringing photographs with you, and our landscape professionals will be glad to Mm-hmm. Look at your unique landscape situation and help you to get the right plant in the right place the first time, because that's the way we do it at Bates Nursery and Garden Center, where since 1932, we have been beautifying Nashville. And one of the things that we do that, that helps to uh, have success is we, we wholeheartedly endorse the entire line of earth mix products. This week, however, Josh, yes, there is a single product that is available uh, in a bagged form that is 20% off along Landscape. with all, all trees, excluding Japanese maples, yeah. uh, is Earth Mix Landscape. That is correct. So we uh-huh. are uh, offering that to all of our Bates Rewards members. And if yep. you happen to not be a Bates Rewards member, it takes about 30 seconds to sign up. It doesn't cost you anything. Wow. You get my newsletter once a week. And if you decide you don't want that anymore, you can just unsubscribe. So... I do try to give you uh, some uh, seasonal gardening information, things uh-huh. that I think that are important to keep in mind Trimming. and to help to help increase your odds of having success in your garden. So come on out and see us. We're conveniently located one mile north of Briley Parkway at exit 19 on White's Creek Pike. That's just minutes from Rivergate, Opry Mills, Nashville West, downtown Nashville. And regardless of where you're coming from, it is worth the drive from anywhere. Yep. Check out our website, BatesNursery.com, or um, you know, drop us an email, give us a call, 615-876-1014. Bates Nursery and Garden Center will be open at 9 a.m., so that's just yep. coming up in a few minutes here. So check it out, and we appreciate you giving us a moment to discuss that and uh, help you with your gardening efforts. Yes, and use your, use your savings on your trees except for the Japanese maples and the landscape on something else around here. We've got all kinds of cool stuff. Yes, and let's and get lighting. into some of that cool yeah. stuff with... What's in Room with Caroline? Ooh, all right. So let's talk about everything that we have around the green room this morning. So like we discussed at the top of the broadcast, we did go with a more tropical theme today. And a lot of pink stuff. So on me and Austin's side, we've got Pink Star Calathea, which is, yep, there we go. Right here, this Beautiful. gorgeous giant pink leaf. Mm. These are lovely plants. Beautiful. I would say they're for someone with more of a green thumb. They can be pretty <laughs> finicky, especially through the winter. It takes not a lot of work to keep them alive and thriving, but they love humidity and they need the exact type of watering to happen for them to be happy. Down in front of us, we've got a pink Fetonia. This one is a great plant. Really, really easy. Good beginner plant. It actually starts to vine and kind of, I wouldn't say vine, but it does drape. So it'll start growing over its pot. Cool. We see how this one is starting to do that. Um, so it's a great filler and again low maintenance easy care towards the back we've got dragon scale alocasia (sighs) let me bring one of these leaves forward Um, look at that so they're really really I mean you can't feel the thickness of this leaf because you're on the other side of this video (laughs) but this is one of the (laughs) thickest leaves that I've had up in the houseplant greenhouse and when it comes out it has this really really pretty green color (sighs) that contrasts to the black uh, or dark green on the leaf but as far as alocasia goes, I have one of these, and it's really, really easy to care for. I absolutely love it, and it also likes low light. Then the last plant we have over here, we brought in some Thai constellations. So currently we have this um, 
in the houseplant area. So this is a, you know, considered to be a rare houseplant. I would say about four years ago, this plant itself would probably cost you $1,200. Stop. And it's starting mm -hmm. to come Ooh. down because it's way more available on the market. Um, they're getting cheaper. So that is a great thing if you've always wanted one. It's got really, really pretty variegation. And again, Monstera are really easy to grow as long as you research it a little bit. So this is a great thing to add to your plant collection if you're looking for something pretty rare. And we have a few in stock right now. Mm. So let's go ahead and head to the other side of the studio where all y'all are sitting. Behind you, under the TV, under the monitor, we've got Dracaena. We've got Art Comet. Carmen. Yeah, Art Carmen. <laughs> we've got Limelight, which is that pretty neon color. And wow. right above David's head, it looks kind of like a, a nice wig on him if he moves <laughs> to his right a little bit. That's going to be Gold Star. So these are great low maintenance plants. If you want something to add a look to your living room, your bedroom, uh, they're low water. They're very versatile when it comes to lighting. They can handle very, very low light to high filtered light. The only thing that's going to kill them is watering them too much and putting them into direct sunlight. And then right behind David, that dark thing in the corner is Gorgeous. going to be a Benjamina ficus. Oh, so no. it's more of a columnar shape. It goes from the ground all the way up. And then behind Tyler, I don't know if we can see it. We've got ficus triangularis. I don't know if he can pull it over a little yeah. bit. This is a really cool plant. It's a uh, big one too. You usually don't see them this Pick big, on. but be warned, it will probably drop a lot of its leaves in the winter they tend to try to go dormant even when they're indoors wow. but it is a really cool plant you can see the white around the edges of the leaves uh, and the Ooh. leaves are a cool triangular shape so really really cool house Sweet. plant if you know what you're doing mm -hmm. and then down in front we've got some more basic house front. plants but really really good ones anthurium on the corner we've got a couple different types of aglionema great low maintenance low light house plant and then down in front we just got a lot of syngonium in if you don't know what that is, arrowhead vine is its common name. It is a great plant, really easy to care for, and it gets really big over time. Oh. So, and it's pink. And it's pink, That's just pink. like Austin said. He loves those mm. pink flowers, those pink leaves. Mm -hmm. We went with a pink theme, um, but that's what we've got in the green room today. So. Wait a minute. Austin wasn't here last week. No, uh, he wasn't. Did you go see Barbie? Yeah. No. You haven't gone seen Barbie? I yet? haven't seen Barbie yet. Mm -mm. Mm, okay. Caroline, you He's were... just ex Oh, I saw Barbie and I absolutely loved it. Okay. Tyler saw it last night. Yep, really? I did. Did you wear pink? I wore a kind of like minty green. Oh. And okay. then the best like, you know, I tried to get like reddish shorts, you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> but my my sandals at least match my shorts. There so, you go. It's better know. to look good than it is to be good, right? Uh-huh. Okay. But you looked so fancy. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> I more importantly was the dance sequence with the Kins was phenomenal. Oh my god, it was so and good. It went on for a long time in a good way. I didn't yes. want it to end. I the only thing that I did want more out of Barbie, I think, was the uh the plants, but they did uh -huh. have plastic bird of paradise. Very good. That uh I believe Ken kicks over. <laughs> And it's just it's just really funny seeing how they plasticified everything. Yeah, it was a great movie. It's very true to uh, the Barbie accessories and the scale that they do for Barbie accessories to the Barbie size is on point. Fantastic. And you know what the worst pain in the world is, Austin? Mm. Stepping on a Barbie shoe. Mm. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh. Okay. I would say a Lego's yeah, probably Legos worse because mean. Barbie shoes well, are pretty soft. I don't know. They're, 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 they got a little bit of squish in them. I still have some Barbie shoes, actually. Okay. But we do have more questions, so let's and get off also, the Barbie topic and and back we also to questions. Have what to know what's in, in blue. blue. <laughs> With Austin. All right, let's do it. I'm going ahead and get this one out of the way so I don't owe anybody any more money. Butterfly Bush. <laughs> I hope you're watching. You took 27 of my dollars last two weeks ago for that old Pugster Blue Butterfly Bush. Hope it's doing well. Uh, there you sure go, Butterfly Bush. Great. I'm sure it is too. I picked it, so it's got to be great. <laughs> he ended up buying two, but I had to buy him there one. You go. So, uh, yeah, butterfly bush is blooming. I'll say, and when we go to trees, what let's go. Is that? I don't know. Rosa Sharon, like we talked about earlier, just money this year. Just mm -hmm. money. They're beautiful. Crepe myrtle still going, of course. They go forever. Mimosa still showing off, okay? Mm. Shrubs, hibiscus, beautiful. I love hibiscus. Just massive blooms. It's, it's, it's just, I'm just a sucker for massive blooms. Uh, hydrangeas, got to. All your limelights are looking good. I bet all your limelights are flopping a little bit right now. Am I right? Yeah. Probably. Mine are flopping Probably. a little bit. Probably. Yep. Probably. It's mm -hmm. been wet. Mm -hmm. Wet in the summer means floppy hydrangeas typically. I'm sorry about this, but it's, okay. it's part of it. They're still pretty. They're still pretty. Okay. Yes. Zinnias, 
and Vinca are two <sighs> annuals that I picked. Oh yeah, because they're showing off, man. I passed a zinnia bed this morning, and, and you know, y'all know me. I'm not the biggest zinnia guy, Don't like but them. they put the these in guy. tight. And there is a massive little strip of zinnias that I passed this morning that are just really showing off. And you loved it, didn't you? And you said, I wish I had some growing in my house right now. I didn't necessarily love it, but I do think that they looked healthy. Amazing. <laughs> it's been a great Amazing. year for zinnias, it's first actually. Year yeah, it's been wet enough been this great. summer where they've just been really, Minor, they, they've liked it. Mine have uh -huh. taken off. My vinca looks real good. My vinca is real pretty right now. I put it in tight, real tight, and they are looking great. All right, day lilies, still going. I'm not the biggest day lily guy. No, They're mine are still cool. going though. They're kind of I mean, mine they're quit early this year. They were like, "I'm done, dude. Yeah. I hate this." Yeah, I mean, some of them did do that. There are you know day lilies that return, like happy returns is a common name, and it's like that or a cultivar name. They'll they'll rebloom up for a fair amount of time. So I noticed some this morning on my way in, still going. Canna lilies still going with the oranges, the reds, the even the yellow cannas look really pretty. And then I've got a weird one for y'all. What? The old surprise lily. Mm. Oh. Lycoris is oh, the genus yeah. of this plant. And what a weird plant. Why yeah. does it do what it does? It comes out in the spring with leaves that kind of look like lilies. Kind of. It's a different yep. genus altogether. And then those leaves just go away. Why? I don't know. They come out, and then they just decide to drop. Poof. They totally drop to the dirt. You can just mow them. You ain't even got to keep them up. And then, like a month later, they bloom, which is what's happening now. It's those one stalk Surprise. with four... <laughs> pink blooms atop of it typically and you're seeing these around in people's yards usually um and i don't know just like evolutionarily why would they decide to do that why get rid of that foliage and i'm assuming my only thought is like let's get rid of the foliage so i can put all of my energy into this bloom but it's like all other plants don't have to do that they keep their foliage up while they bloom so i'm still confused by this if y'all got a better explanation Help me out because I don't know. But surprise, Lily's Lycoris, cool plant to grow. It's in the um, Amaryllidaceae family. It is. It is. Okay. Uh, there you Amaryllidocious. Go. How about Amaryllidaceae. that? Amaryllidaceae. <laughs> so there you go. That's what you're yeah, seeing around town blooming. Uh, Edward, hey, here's another uh, ahead, interesting David. plant fun fact right, that fact. doesn't come up very often simply because it doesn't happen very often. Uh, each uh, Phytostachys, which is a bamboo family plant, they all go through a, a life cycle. A black bamboo, uh, Phytostachys nigra, which is, you know, people have it around. Every, each cultivar, they're not on the same cycle, but each cultivar every 220 years or so mm. will completely die out. And it does it worldwide over wow. a period of about two years. So if you have black bamboo and it looks like it's dying, that's what's going on. Huh. It is dying. Now, oh, they will produce seed. They can come back from seed. As a matter of fact, that's how they do recover. But uh, if you have black bamboo and you don't understand what's going on with it, that's what's going on with it. Mm. So, Interesting. Wow. Uh, Worldwide. Mm. Cool. Uh, Edward yeah. and Risha from Smyrna, the butterfly family. Uh huh. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're, 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 they're not uh, laughing with you. They're laughing at you. <laughs> and, uh, yes. Risha okay. says that the comment was money. Uh, it was money. Okay. All right, good. So. I'm glad your butterfly bush looks good. You're welcome. He says it's doing great. Literally money. Uh-huh. You're welcome. Uh -huh. It's going to be lovely. Uh -huh. So we've got a couple questions this week from one of our viewers, Horton Monroe. Um, send some photos. I'm not sure if Tyler is going to be able to pull them up. But one was, he's wondering what worm, what type of worm would be eating the leaves on his tomato so what do you think that would be i know oh, we had a photo but there's there's one uh -huh. josh uh -oh. even nailed it the old horn. tomato hornworm i took a good picture of a hornworm and sent it to tyler the other day um that's probably what's happening usually with hornworm okay very very tricky to spot even though they're very large worms they're still very hard to see so what you typically see first is damage yep. okay you're going to see a stalk of a tomato that just has no leaves on it and it just looks like it's been wrecked you know, and then you know to look for that hornworm, and you really got to look for that hornworm. It'll be, you know, like on a stem, mainly on stems eating leaves. Um, and when you spot it, it'll scare you. You're like, whoa, whoa, what a worm! Oh my gosh, <laughs> they what fluoresce a big under worm. a black light as well, don't they? Do what they fluoresce under a black light as well, don't they? Uh, I think you're right about that. Yeah, yeah I've it, heard people go out at night to. I was well, going to say harvest them. but you Well, know. it's a sphinx moth yes. is what it turns into with those big whitish green moths you see at night oh. under the light. That's what they turn into. My kids and my wife actually decided to try to keep one in a contained area 
watch it metamorphosize, but we ended up going on vacation, and I don't know where that worm Oh, no. Uh, I'm sure it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Chickens love them, you know? I understand, as well. Oh, so. God, yeah. That's a good point. But, yeah, we picked off, I think we picked off three or four off of my uh, tomato plants. So, yeah, go out there and look for them. Google tomato hornworms so you know what you're looking for because they are hard to see. When you do see them, just pluck them off, throw them away, cut them in half, whatever you got to do. What? So, what do you think? There we go. Oh, that uh, could be. Well, there's that's poop. The poop. I mean, yeah, that's the leftover poop from a probably a hornworm. Mm. Get in there and look for it. What about the holes? That's pretty minimal damage, though. Honestly, yeah. Uh, as the whole tomato just plant be goes. the beginning. What about yeah, I mean, the hornworm will take all of the leaf. Yeah. Like it's rare that it's like from the interior, so it may not be hornworm at all. There's army worms yeah. that really like tomatoes. A whole host of caterpillars. That will eat a whole number of different things. So it could be any type of caterpillar, really. But um, get in there and look for it. Like I said, they hide pretty well. Usually, backsides of the leaves. They ain't making it easy on you. They ain't just nope. sitting right on top. Mm-mm, no, they're, they're not waiting for you. They're uh-huh. hiding from you. Yeah. All right. To wrap everything up, I know that Austin loves to talk about hydrangeas. So mm-hmm. we've got some hydrangea questions in today. But really quickly, I did want to talk about what I did to my hydrangeas in. April. So Austin's always talking about coming through in the spring and cutting back your hydrangea so you get a tighter bloom and uh, it blooms a little bit later than everything else. So I did do that, but I didn't do all of mine because I did it real late, like mid to late April. I said, I'm going to go out and do it, but I'm a little bit scared. So I did about half of it. And what has happened is I have one round of blooms on this particular panicle hydrangea, and I'm about to have my second round of blooms will probably be opening in a week or so. So that's pretty exciting. The original blooms, what's blooming now is very floppy. So I went ahead and cut them back and I have them in vases in my house. And I'm really excited that I'm going to get a round two. So great tip, Austin. Just like you're it. so smart mm-hmm. when it comes to hydrangea. I just love them. Y'all know what? I'm giving a speech tomorrow for the yes, Rose are. Society. The Rose Society. Oh Rosarians. So I'm a little nervous. They had a keg when David talked you. to them last time. Really? That's what I heard. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm really excited now. They needed it. I'm giving they them a it speech. Down, they needed it. <laughs> they needed it. <laughs> I'm giving a speech about hydrangeas tomorrow to the Rose Society. At Chiquin. And I Ooh. hope they got a keg. Man, that sounds Party fun. with keg. More like a uh-huh. cask they, than a keg, they probably. Could, yeah, it could get long-winded. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's hope get these hydrangea questions in real quick. Like, Do it. Which hydrangea can I prune way back in winter without worry of blooms? It's going to be your Annabelle type. So Incredible, Annabelle, any of those, you can certainly take back. You can take them to the dirt if you want to. Don't matter. And also mm-hmm. panicle style hydrangeas. So your limelights, your little limes, your bobos, all of those that are panicles, you can take those back without a problem. Do not do it to your endless summer variety. Nope. So those ones that bloom pink and blue that are round balls that we all like, uh, do not prune those. I don't even recommend pruning them at all, to be honest with you. Leave every bit of that up so you get a good chance of getting blooms for the next season. Mm-hmm. And speaking of that type of hydrangea, why isn't my seaside serenade hydrangea blooming? Well, it's not by the ocean. That, <laughs> there it is. It's not by uh, the ocean. Okay, okay. Can't see the beach. I'm wondering if you planted it recently. Um, it may not bloom this year. I hate to say that, but it may not. And there's a Seaside Serenade collection. I'm not sure which one. There's like arborescence type, but there's also macrophylla types of the Seaside Serenade. So I need to know which one. But if it is the macrophylla types, none of them bloom this year, y'all. We had that late frost that just whacked all of those right. mm-hmm. macrophylla hydrangeas. None of us are getting good blooms yeah, this year with none those. of mine have bloomed. Uh-uh. I was so excited about them, too. Yeah. It's not happening. Stargazer didn't do a thing. Mm. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Hydrangeas That's are great, though. We plant... A lot of variety of things because not nice. everything does great every year. That's right. It's just That's nature right. of it. No blooms. Mm-hmm. So hey, was, you see on the map up there, I pulled that up oh. just to kind of show you know, the uh, storms. I kind of moved into the West Tennessee area. We might get a little bit here in the middle of Tennessee. But uh, again, be weather aware as we uh, go through uh, every day this time of year. It is just that time of year. We're getting a lot of of uh, uncontrolled precipitation as is always the case i don't know anybody who can really control it so anyway be aware and uh, uh, stay in the garden you know there's nothing yep. happening that's going to keep you from being able to have success in your gardening efforts so nope there you go there you go hey folks it's saturday morning we're done for the day but next saturday we're going to come back and do another at home show sure are 
So yeah. come out to the nursery today and take advantage of the sale love on to see trees. Be, be here to four o'clock. By yeah, twenty percent off on everything except the uh, trees, uh, except for Japanese maples and landscape. Yeah, okay, let, let, yeah. let landscape me rephrase that it so that it makes sense. It's twenty percent off all trees except. Japanese Except maples. Japanese maples and bagged earth mix landscape. Yes, so, absolutely. I don't yeah. want to misstate that. It'll y'all come too. out and talk to me about trees today? Yes. I'm about to give y'all some tree talk. And meet our tree lot duck. Yep. Oh, yeah. Tree, tree lot duck. Now. Okay. Going to meet them. Uh-huh. All righty, folks. We thank you for being here. Go out on social media everywhere you're at. Like us. Subscribe. Share. Send you know, send stars if you want to. You know, Do everything. So Because we're going to try to keep coming to you. That, that'll help. Sure will. See you next Saturday morning from the Green Room studios here at Bates Nursery and Garden Center.